Mike Rodak at Mike Rodak on Twitter. 247 Sports covers Alabama. Joins us on 365 Sports. Mike, thank you very much for your time with Paul Craig. And I'm David Smoke. The uh, the players meeting after the performance against USF, you can't do that a lot. You can't have another one in three weeks. you got to have like one of them and then it better work. What was it about? Just clearing the air or maybe something else? Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things. It's like it's never a good sign when there's a players only meeting. It's, it's kind of a, it's, I want to say a death knell, but it's never been a, a good point in any season that I've covered on, on any team that I've covered. So uh, just to hear that in the first place was a little bit alarming. But, um, you know, there's, there's different theories and, and there's been different things that have come out in terms of, you know, what actually was the reason for it. Um, there's, a, a lot of evidence, I'll say, that, you know, it wasn't a great week of practice for Jalen Milrow, that he didn't handle uh, the benching uh, very well. Um, and there's there's also been some suggestions around here that, you know, maybe players were, you know, there was favoritism towards a particular player. I think, you know, Jalen Milrow is certainly well-liked on the team. Um, I think players supported, you know, what he did against Texas. And um, I personally don't know if there's as much support for, for Ty Simpson or Tyler Buckner. So, um, you know, we, we got some hints and some clues from players on what exactly was the reason for it. But, um, you know, togetherness is is one of the words that came out, you know, from from Tyler Booker as one of the team leaders. And he was talking about that, that players meeting. So uh, kind of rallying around a single quarterback and not trying to have different um, opinions, I think, is, is really their goal. Mike, how did they go from the, you know, just – go into the refrigerator and take another quarterback out to what they're doing now. How did Nick Saban of all people get caught in this situation? Yeah, it, it's been messy. Um, and I, I think the big question, and I, I mean, I, I don't know the answer personally. Um, I think only Nick Saban knows this answer is whether he was already planning on having his other quarterbacks play in this South Florida game, knowing that South Florida has been one of the worst teams in college football the last couple of years, even though the game's on the road, it's, I mean, it was a 50, 50 crowd um, in Tampa and, and you can get away with at least seeing what you have in Tyler Buckner and, and or Ty Simpson in that game. And it might've been something that was already on his mind, maybe even before the Texas game, um, you know, before Jalen Miller threw the two interceptions. So, um, to know exactly, you know, what Nick Saban's plan was, if it was different than what was, you know, kind of put out there publicly that, um, you know, he went with a different quarterback just for that game. It, it's hard to say. Um, but it, again, I, I, th- I don't know if it had the best effect on the players. I think it is a little bit of a whiplash effect where you're going from one quarterback to the next. And, um, th- and I think that's the reason why Nick Saban came out yesterday, you know, the to start the week of the Ole Miss game instead of waiting until the end of the week and just say Jalen Miller is our quarterback this week to stop the the game that he was kind of playing for a while in terms of, you know, we're going to continue to evaluate the position and we're not going to give out a depth chart, et cetera, et cetera. He did that the entire fall camp um, and just kind of, again, have one name, one guy that, that players can kind of get behind. So, Mike, he's now the guy. There's no disputing that, uh, and and that's all cleared up for the time being. Uh, So now, having seen what we've seen, I mean, everybody watched the Texas game and saw how feast or famine that was, and then obviously being replaced. Uh, What do you expect uh, them to do in regards to Jalen Milrow, and and how can they get the most out of his game? Yeah, I mean, when they first got Jalen Milrow as a freshman two years ago, they mostly ran read option stuff with him, and and he was really a a running quarterback who – all the you know scouting reports and everything Nick Saban would say a couple of years ago that Jalen Murrow needs to develop as a passer, and I think he's done that to a certain extent. I mean, we saw him connect on some deep passes against Texas, um, even in the opener against Middle Tennessee. He you know he had some pretty good deep balls, um, so he's gotten better. But he's still you know his, his biggest strength is still his his ability to run and his ability to escape. Um, so, you know, maybe we see them drift a little bit more towards that sort of offense. I don't think they're going to run the triple option, but uh, maybe some more design runs and, and trying to use him in, in that way. I personally don't know if Nick Saban wants to do that. I think Nick Saban wants to run more of a, you know, an RPO spread type offense that he's, he's run with other quarterbacks that he's had. But, you know, this is kind of what they have. And, you know, I, Saban wants his quarterback to be a point guard is what he always says and not a shooting guard and um, avoid the big mistake, distribute the ball. Don't try to make the big play when it's, when it's risky. 
I mean, Milrow's kind of the guy that, that seems to want to do that um, more than Simpson and Buckner. And, and to their credit, Simpson and Buckner didn't throw any picks on Saturday. It was terrible besides that, but they didn't throw any picks. And, and that's really what gets Nick Saban mad. So if Milrow can avoid the interceptions, then he's going to be in a good spot. If he does throw a couple interceptions, you know, is this completely shut down and we're not going to ever see another quarterback? I don't think so. Um, but, you know, it's, we'll have to see what happens Saturday. I think it would have to get really bad for Milrow to get pulled out of this game. I can't imagine with Nick Saban, his head would explode. One, that they're not playing well. There are also too many penalties. It's just not right. But give Texas credit for what they did and perhaps the others. But for him, if there's any inkling that maybe some players on Saturday in Tampa just didn't quite get all locked in because of the quarterback decision, what would that, that would would that not make his head explode based on what he thought what he thinks about the team? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a strange spot, um, and you know, obviously, what you hear from players in terms of we're going to rally behind every guy, and you know, it doesn't matter who the quarterback is. I think we all know as humans, like that's probably not the truth and each of these guys kind of has their own opinion and their own favorite in their in their own head so um you know i've i've covered quarterback controversies and competitions before and this is sometimes what happens and um you know it 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 divides teams and it um you know causes confusion and and kind of causes problems so this is something nick saban i mean i guess he's dealt with it before you know it's been a while you know, you had to hold Tua and Jalen Hurts thing, but that was kind of picking between two really good quarterbacks. So that's not really what they're doing right now. Uh, this is probably closer to like 2015 when they're choosing between, you know, Jake Coker and, and Cooper Bateman. Um, and, you know, they won a national championship that year, but, you know, they had Derrick Henry that year and they don't have Derrick Henry right now. So I think it's going to be a little bit harder for him. Do you think he regrets not getting in the transfer portal earlier? Uh, you know, I, I would imagine they were trying. Um, and, you know, as we all know, a guy doesn't necessarily have to go into the transfer portal. There's always kind of back channel ways of seeing if a guy's interested, you know, in coming somewhere. And I think Sam Hartman even said that Alabama, you know, when he was in the portal, you reached out um, when he was leaving um, Wake Forest. And, you know, I, I think the prize for Alabama would have been Drake May. You know, he was committed to them out of high school. He ended up flipping to, to North Carolina. You know, obviously, as a top two or three quarterback in college football, yeah, I would be shocked if they didn't, you know, kind of back channel and then see if he was interested. Obviously, he stayed. And and I think Tyler Buckner was further down that list. It's like NFL free agency. You kind of have to work your way down. And Buckner was was probably more in in the bargain bin. Um, And that's what they were able to get. And it was after spring practice. I think Buckner's kind of been behind the eight ball in terms of trying to learn the offense. And, uh, you know, we saw the results of that on Saturday. Mike, uh, so who's calling plays for the Alabama defense after Lane Kiffin stirred the pot this week right in advance of this big game on Saturday? Yeah, that was a little bit interesting. I, you know, I, I don't immediately dismiss Lane. I, I think there might be some truth to what he saw and, and, and what he was saying, and I don't necessarily think right away that he was doing it to cause a distraction. It might be a... Um, an unintended benefit, you know, from him. But, um, you know, it was something where it was a very strange situation. The South Florida game had the lightning delay, and then ESPN cameras came back, but their camera guys couldn't go back to their station. So there was a static camera showing that game, and you could see all what was happening on the Alabama sideline in between plays. So you could see Traveris Robinson, the secondary coach, is down on the field. He had his play sheet. He's signaling calls to the defense. And that might have been what Ole Miss saw um, on, on that TV copy. And Kevin Steele, who's a defensive coordinator his first year, is up in the booth. And so you're, you're playing against the South Florida offense that, you know, as Tennessee offensive coordinator and now it's goalish, they want to run plays every five or seven seconds to try to have Kevin Steele in the booth give that call down to someone on the field and then get that out to the players in five seconds is pretty tough. And so I think, and then Saban alluded to this himself, they kind of had to streamline things to get the call out quicker, which is where I think Robinson was probably taking more of a, you know, a front end role. Um, so, you know, Ole Miss runs pretty fast too. They could do the same thing this week, and, but I don't know if it's necessarily a, a coordinator change. And that's, you know, obviously something that Nick Saban pushed back against himself. So there's obviously been a lot of, uh, you know, 
angst is as far as you know how Alabama's looked this far, and that's led into you know a lot of people thinking Ole Miss is the choice uh, this week uh, because of, of what we've seen from Alabama, but also what we've seen from the Rebs. What are your thoughts going into this game, uh, you know, Alabama and Ole Miss, and, and where do you kind of stand on you know who who uh, I guess it should be favored in this game? Is it is it as dire as it's been made out to be on the Crimson Tide side of things? You know, I, I wouldn't be shocked if they won, but I, I'm a little bit surprised that the line came out. I saw some places initially, like 11 points. I think that was really high. Whew. And then some other books came out at like six or seven, you know, later on Sunday. And I think that's a little bit closer. And, you know, three or four might even be where I put it. And, um, you know, it's it's close to a push. It's one of those games that I'm really interested in watching. And, it's you know, it's been a good series um, the last three years since Lane Kiffin's been there. That, remember 2020? That was like one of the highest scoring, highest yardage games ever. Mm-hmm. It was 63-48. And then there was a ton of hype coming into that game the next year. You know, Lane Kiffin coming back to Bryant Denny, and they just completely flopped. Ole Miss came in, tried all these fourth down conversions, and it worked. Game was over by the first quarter. And then last year, Ole Miss went up 10 nothing in Oxford. And Alabama came back. Ole Miss had a chance at the end of the game, drove down the field to the 19-yard line, and they could have won it. And – you know, they got stopped. So, I mean, Ole Miss has had some chances to beat Alabama, and I think this is probably their best one that they've had under Lane Kiffin, given where Alabama is and, you know, kind of given where Ole Miss is with that offense and, and Jackson Dart. <clears throat> Mike, thank you, man. Appreciate your time. It's been obviously a long time since Alabama was in this position. A lot of streaks have been broken. Ole Miss this weekend, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. You got it. Thank you. Mike Rodak covers Alabama for 247 Sports. In this position at 2-1, and 